Hi, everyone that is watching us. My name is Cristina Mastrobuono. I am the vice president of the uh, C Charter Institute of Arbitrators Brazilian branch. I am here with Cesar Pereira, our former president and actual treasurer. And we want to present you a very, very interesting webinar that will discuss the critical issues of the Vismut problem, the Vismut and Vis East uh, mood problem. Well, I, I wanted to start this webinar by saying, yes, we are going to Vienna. So, and we are going to Hong Kong because I am sure that everyone that's watching us is very happy that this will happen this year after so many years that we could not meet in person. Uh, Vismut is a wonderful opportunity to enhance our professional skills, our student skills, but also a very uh, unique opportunity to develop an international network, which is also very important for our careers. So uh, the Vismut this year has a very interesting problem involving um, a state entity, a state-owned uh, corporation. This is something very different as far as I know from the former Vismut problems. And actually for it's, it, it's interesting because this is something that is already happening in Brazil a lot. Uh, state-owned companies and the state directly governments are engaging in uh, arbitration. And some of the issues that are there already um, came up in some of the disputes. So uh, our goal today is to bring you some critical aspects of the problem. Uh, we will start today with the procedural issues. And for that, we could bring to our webinar three very, very uh, important professionals in the arbitration community, in the international arbitration community. And I will make a brief introduction because they have a long uh, resume. It's almost impossible to, to describe it, but I will start with our moderator, Luisa. Luisa is a foreign associate at Schaffetz Lindsay LLP in New York. She's also an associate at Justin Pereira Oliveira in Talamini from Sao Paulo, where she obtained significant experience with arbitrations concerning government contracts and public policy. Luisa also served as coordinator, uh, coordination assistant of the Brazilian Arbitration Community. Uh, committee, sorry, CBAR, a study group in state-related arbitration. She's also a MUTI in, and an associate of CR. Uh, Dr. Krina Baltak is a fellow from the Charter Institute, is associate professor in international arbitration at Stockholm University and qualified attorney at law with 20 years of extensive practice in various aspects on international dispute resolution private and public international law. Krina is the academic director of the Master in International Commercial Arbitration Law at Stockholm University and member of the board and of the Arbitration Institute of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. She's the managing editor of Clever Arbitration Blog, co-managing editor of ITA Arbitration Report and member of editorial boards of prestigious journals and book series in the field, including of the Journal of International Arbitration. Krina has been appointed as arbitrator in numerous arbitrations under the rules of the ICC, LICA, SAIC, SEC, FIA, VIAC, etc., and has acted as expert in various international commercial and investment arbitrations. Now, Sophie Napert is an arbitrator in independent practice based in London. She's dual qualified as an advocate of the Bar of Quebec, Canada, and as a solicitor of the Supreme Court of England and Wales, and trained and has practiced in both civil law and common law jurisdictions. Before becoming a full-time arbitrator, she pursued a career as an advocate and was head of international arbitration at the global law firm. 
at our global offering. She is commended as most highly regarded and a leading light in her field by who's who legal. She's highly sought after in complex energy investment and natural resources disputes. She's a guest lecturer at Columbia Law School, Harvard Law School, and McGill University Faculty of Law. She created the Napert Prize in Inter International Arbitration, open to young scholars and practitioners worldwide, administered under the auspices of McGill University. Wow, this is too much. <laughs> and I left something out because otherwise I would just be speaking here. Well, uh, with no further ado, I will just start our uh, discussion today and I hand it over to you, Luisa. And first, I want really to thank you all for joining the webinar and for our guest speakers for giving a little bit of your time today. Thank you very much. Luisa, please go on. Thank you so much, Christina. You said something about long resumes. I, I don't think I have a long resume, especially now that I've heard <laughs> so much, um, even more than what I already knew about our um, stellar speakers today. So I thank you too for the opportunity to be here and to moderate a discussion amongst such um, steam practitioners, but also with you and Cesar who are dear friends um, from Brazil and, and, and I'm very excited um, to be here. So the way that we have organized things today and basically to explain why this event is called Are You Participating <laughs> in the Vids Moot? Um, so we gathered uh, Krina and Sophie to discuss the procedural issues of the VIS problem. For those of you who are already familiar with the VIS, you know that usually the case is structured so that you have a couple of issues focusing on jurisdictional or procedural um, matters and then a couple of issues on the merits. The way that CIR Brazil branch has organized this panel leaves us with just the first part of, of the issues. And next week, we're going to have another set of stellar speakers uh, um, covering the, the two other issues on the merits, on the merits and, and, and CISG related. I'll try to, uh, before we get into the, the real part and, and where our um, speakers will, will share a bit of their knowledge with you, I'll try to give an overview of the case uh, to make sure everybody that is listening, uh, especially for some arbitrators that may not have read the case yet, uh, and, and to, to make sure that we're all aligned in, in that the discussion that Krina and, and Sophie are going to bring to us um, are, are, are helpful to everyone. So what's happening in this year's Visma problem? I think Krishna already uh, hinted it to you that it looks a lot <laughs> like whoever's already worked in, in public projects or um, state related disputes are in, in real life. There are some issues that uh, are in fact familiar <laughs> it, from some of the cases that I, that I had um, the opportunity to work with while at Justing. But who are the, the parties in, in this case and, and where they're from? So the claimant in, in this arbitration is Dronai PLC, which is a medium-sized producer of unmanned IRO system, which is just a fancy way of saying drones. Um, they're based in Mediterranean, and the drones that they produce are primarily used for geoscience exploration. The respondent in the case is Equatoriana Geoscience, which is a private company, but entirely owned by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Development of the government of Equatoriana. This um, company, wholly state-owned, was created with, um, within a specific project of the then socialist government to develop the northern part of Equatoriana. Back then, and, and perhaps still until now, that was the least uh, developed area in the country. So the state decided to fund this project to develop that area. So as part of its creation purpose, responded needed to ensure that all the geological, geophysical, and other scientific data concerning that region was available, was gathered first, and then available for other purposes of the project. But what happened was that respondent by itself as a newly funded company, as a government con uh, a, a government owned company, didn't have the resources to gather all that data on its own. So he had to outsource. So he had to look for 
third party contractors to provide them with services that would enable them to gather this type of data. And that's how respondent came up with the public standard where they asked um, bidders to submit uh, submit bids for the delivery and maintenance of primarily four drones that would use for this earth surveillance and exploration purposes. Claimant's bid was selected as one of two, but then there was a second phase, which is where it's going uh, to start interesting for our purposes here. Um, after um, claimant submitted a bid complying with what were the, the, the requirements of the, the public tender, they have, a, they have separate negotiations to discuss. That, that, that isn't illegal um, in Equatoriana, but um, according um, to respondent itself, that I may say, it, it, it was highly unusual. So there was some meetings to rather uh, further discuss the scope of the contract, and one meeting in particularly was conducted on respondent size only by its then um, COO, which is Mr. David Field. And apparently in this meeting, claimant came up with a new offer to respondent, offering then six drones instead of four, which would come in, in terms of the goods price at a lower price, but also encompassed a longer and more expensive maintenance service um, provision. Respondent um, accepted. This, the, the, the new offer, the public standard, and the party signed the agreement. And then again, to what's more relevant uh, to our part here is that this agreement had an arbitration <laughs> agreement, an arbitration clause. And that arbitration clause provided for PCA rules, uh, as for the institutional rules that govern the procedure. And at some point in, in a few months after the contract uh, was signed by the party's um, CEOs, not the COO that, that, that received the offer, but the, the party CEOs and, and the Minister of Natural Resources, uh, respondent requested some amendments to, to this clause, specifically to include provisions concerning expedited arbitration rules and also the unilateral rules of transparency in, in investor state arbitration. And, and then getting to the main point, what happened? What happened in this contract? Why is claimant happy? Why are we here? Respondent um, delivered the first three domes, drones, but then things went out of plan for the parties here. There was an article published by um, a, a, a media portal called The Citizen in Equatoriana, which was um, apparently exposing the, um, an alleged corruption scheme involving the project that was created to develop the northern part of, of Equatoriana. Immediately after that, the prime minister of the then socialist government resigned and a new government was established. Uh, and, and this new government was a coalition of both conservative and, and liberal parties. And the first thing that the, this new government did is um, establish a moratorium on all contracts that had, si had been signed by the Equatorian government as part of the Northern Park Development um, Program. So they also started at the same time investigations about related contracts, including the contract with claimant for the purchase and, and, and maintenance of these drones. And these investigations included in specifically a set of investigations concerning this respondent COO, which is David Field. Um, he has already been charged at this point with uh, for cases in, in two other separate contracts. And the investigations concerning claimant's contract uh, will probably only end in the end of, of 2023. What respondent does at this point is basically put the PSA um, on hold and, and claimant unhappy wants the contract, wants the money, and the parties try to negotiate, negotiate but then respondent declares the contract avoided. And then we're here, then we're here, we start arbitration because um, claimant feels that they've been wronged, the respondent breached the contract and, and asked for damages. Uh, but in response, and in, in that finally brings us uh, to, to what, really, uh, what we really are discussing today, uh, a respondent responds with a couple of um, procedural objections. The first one is a jurisdictional objection. Um, respondent understands that the tribunal constituted under the PCA rules does not have jurisdiction 
to decide uh, about this dispute, primarily because they argue that the arbitration agreement is invalid. They deny the validity of the arbitration agreement based on allegations such as the arbitration agreement, the, the entire contract, and by consequence, the arbitration agreement was obtained by corruption. They also um, make other arguments that, that the main contract has already been terminated for other purposes um, other than, than the corruption, and then specifically that this contract lacked a specific authorization from Equatorianus Parliament, which according to, to, to the respondent is a, a statutory law requirement, and, and, and therefore this contract wouldn't be valid under Equatorian law. Respondent's um, subsidiary um, argument is that if the tribunal decides to maintain their jurisdiction, then the tribunal should stay the arbitration proceedings until the end of those investigations that are going on against respondent COO, who made the second offer on this contract, and because they understand that the prosecutors have brought investigative powers and there will be a risk of an incorrect decisions if this very serious public policy related investigations are mistaken uh, or are wrongly interpreted in, in a decision or are inconsistent. Ultimately, what uh, respondents are trying to say, there's a risk there will be inconsistent what of this investigations ultimately find. And complying with an award rendered by this tribunal, uh, according to respondent, would also imply a breach by, by respondent um, with to the anti-corruption law, because there's a provision in Equatorian's uh, and our corruption law that says that agreements obtained through corruption can, should not be enforced. Um, and alternatively, to the stay of the arbitrations um, of the arbitration into the end of investigations, respondent asked the tribunal to bifurcate and decide uh, only on the issues that technically wouldn't be involved on on the underlying um, it on the related to the facts underlying the investigations um, by Equatorian uh, public authorities. So that's the main issues that we, that we have to decide, right? Uh, the tribunal has established now that the parties have in their next submissions and in their oral pleadings in, in Hong Kong or in Vienna in, in a few months, they, they will have to present their submissions and in, in for our purposes here covering mainly two issues, two, two issues which is, does the arbitral tribunal have jurisdiction to hear this dispute? And if the tribunal has jurisdiction, should it stay or bifurcate this proceedings? Um, with that, if and I think I haven't really gone over the time that I reserve, had reserved to, to, to cover the case, I will invite our, our speakers in, invited for today to share their thoughts on, on, on some, of, some of the issues that we have in the case here. So it's pretty clear that the, the, the broader topic here in, in off this case and what the, the, the Vismut organizers try to bring to this case is both the hot topics of state-related arbitration and especially um, arbitration and, and corruption. And for the first part of our discussion, uh, I'll invite um, Sophie Nappert, whose uh, extensive CV you have already heard of from, from Christina, so I will uh, not repeat that, but we are here, uh, we, we are here and curious to, to hear on th your thoughts on this topic. And, and I will clarify before uh, I turn it to you, Sophie, that even though we are doing this event with the purposes of being helpful to those students and arbitrators participating in the Vismut, and we are covering legal issues underlying the Vismut problem, our speakers are not going to make your case for you uh, to all students hearing us. They are not here to pr provide you with the strategy that you and your team should be coming up for yourself. Rather, we're here to share with you um, some ideas and thoughts, and, and, and especially from our speakers, their, their experience on the legal issues, the, the real legal issues that underlying um, this case. So with that, Sophie, uh, I, I'm sure you have some 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 thoughts on on this topic and in in well arbitration and corruption more generally, but in terms of what's relevant for this case, we can't wait to hear. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I am on the corruption side uh, of, of things. I'm going to speak in uh, I think informed by my capacity as a 
co-chair of the ICC working group uh, on uh, allegations of corruption and arbitration. I say this not because I'm going to talk about uh, the, the, the work of the working group, but uh, because the issues that, uh, that are being raised in this case go right to the core of really what uh, tribunals have to grapple in, in practice. Uh, these are not simply, uh, they're very interesting, obviously, from a, an academic uh, and a mooting perspective, but they have real practical implications. And I would urge um, the participants in the moot to keep those practical conse um, consequences and practical difficulties in mind when they make their argument. The legal arguments are always um, more forceful if, um, the Mutis have an understanding, it doesn't have to be an in-depth of this understanding, but at least a, a basic understanding of what it means in practice for a tribunal to be faced with allegations such as this. Um, on the corruption side, um, well, the first thing I, will, I, I wanted to say is uh, we're dealing here with a dispute that is a commercial dispute. That's, that's important to remember. It's a, it's a dispute about a commercial contract uh, with uh, um, an entity that is a private company, uh, albeit fully owned by the state. So that, that in itself is uh, not uninteresting uh, because it means that this is an entity that is entering into commercial agreements in a commercial capacity. And so one must always watch out for arguments that are being raised by a state-owned entity that belong to the sovereign side uh, of things as opposed to the commercial side of things. So uh, it is always important to show, I think, as, a, as an advocate and certainly as a, as a multi, uh, to show an understanding uh, of, of that fact. Um, and any... Um, any attempt, I think, by this the, by that company to sort of raise issues that belong more properly to, them, to the sovereign side of things uh, is something that can be uh, pointed out um, by by the claimant. Um, so that that's the first thing I wanted to say. It's a fairly obvious point, but uh, important not to uh, lose sight of it. And obviously, on the other side of the coin, uh, the respondent will want to. Uh, make it more obvious that it is uh, an arm of the state and that therefore it has certain restrictions that uh, a commercial entity might not uh, might not have. And then obviously this sort of sets out uh, where the dispute should be and the, and the tribunal can, can take a view. Uh, so that's the first thing that I wanted to say on that. The second thing um, perhaps I wanted to say on the question of corruption. Um, it is always, and and that's precisely why the ICC decided to do a, um, a task force on this. Uh, there is absolutely no um, best practice, consensus, um, agreement on many of these issues uh, within arbitration practitioners, uh, in between common law, civil law, trained uh, lawyers. Um, every tribunal, every arbitrator tries to do what they consider in conscience is the best thing to do. But frankly, that is not helpful <laughs> to practitioners because you just do not have, I mean, you have, you're starting to have certain trains of thought, for example, on the, the standard and burden of proof. There is a general, I think, understanding now in our field that uh, the complete reversal of the burden of proof is not an answer that uh, in, our, in a commercial arbitration, one is not looking at uh, proving corruption beyond reasonable doubt, which is, would be a, a criminal standard. But beyond that, um, the standard of proof, you know, is it convincing and clear? Is it just simply the balance of probabilities? Is it, as my French colleagues say, intimate conviction? What is it is exactly the sort of thing that we're looking at in the working group. So that means for, for you advocates and for the arbitrators that the field is completely open. And you can be very creative indeed with your arguments, always keeping in mind that you have to be practical. Now, in this case, you have allegations that are being made. Um, one side says they are not proven. Well, they are very difficult to prove by, by definition. And that's the difficulty of corruption allegations. There is an investigation going on. Parallel proceedings are always very difficult 
What does the tribunal do? What will you suggest, depending on who you're rep representing, the tribunal should do? Should it immediately stay? In, um, in Historically, in practice, arbitration tribunals have been keen to carry on, not to be held up by a, a process over which they have zero control. That can be a strategic process on the part of the state concerned. Uh, and that is, essentially does not allow them um, any visibility uh, into, into what's going on. That approach obviously has the advantage of, um, of more certainty, but the tribunal could get it wrong. The tribunal could find that there is no corruption when in fact, at the end of the day, the investigation will find that there was. And that places uh, the arbitral tribunal and the arbitral process in a very difficult spot indeed. And so, that is a very practical um, uh, challenge uh, on which uh, all type of creative argument can be put forward. You can suggest to the tribunal that they have a dialogue uh, with the authorities. You can suggest to the tribunal that on the other hand, uh, what, whatever is going on with the authorities in a particular um, uh, criminal field has nothing to do with what's going on in the particular commercial dispute. So there is a very wide open field uh, of argument that can be put forward, but the difficulty is real. Um, I will say one, one last word before um, passing on to, uh, to Krina, and it is on bifurcation. So bifurcation is um, a, another uh, very practical point fraught with difficulty. Um, particularly in a case where you have corruption allegations, which by definition will be very enmeshed in uh, the factual makeup of the case. And so how does one clearly delineate and bifurcate issues is, is, a, is, a, is, is really what is at stake here. So whomever argues in favor of bifurcation is, has to be able to show that um, whatever is, go is going on on the corruption side of things will not can actually be hived off completely and not looked at without uh, compromising the rest of the case. Uh, and the other side will have to show on the, on the other hand that uh, the whole thing is completely enmeshed and that bifurcation just cannot happen um, in a clear and definite way. So these are my initial thoughts and uh, I'll pass on to Krina and then we can discuss. Thank you. Rina, I'm sorry, before, before you can start, I just realized I forgot to invite our audience to send their questions uh, through our Q&A. So please feel free, everyone, to send your questions or comments. Thank you very much, uh, Cristina, and, uh, and thank you very much to the Chartered Institute, the Brazilian branch, for, for inviting us and for organizing this very useful series of discussions. Uh, of course, these are not easy topics to address. Uh, and, and, and in particular, I appreciate uh, the fact that uh, the participants in the VSMUD this year, uh, they will have the opportunity to grasp some very relevant questions as, as uh, Sophie was mentioning, uh, the practical issues uh, are highly important. I'm going to, um, focus first on the um, on the stay of proceedings and bifurcation and then I wanted to quickly um, look at one uh, I would say important um, case in the past three years in particular important because it involves one of the one of the Brazilian uh, uh, state-owned companies uh, and I thought that would be relevant uh, for the purpose of our our discussion today um, now, when it comes to stay of proceedings and, and bifurcation, and, and Sophie has alluded to this, I think it's important to think about this in the context of the legal framework the arbitral tribunal operates. Uh, and, and when I, I say legal framework, we start from the arbitration agreement, which may provide uh, for institutional or ad hoc arbitration. And then we move, uh, of course, to the Lex Arbitri, to the law at the seat. Uh, procedure law. And of course, we, we also take into consideration any international conventions, treaties relevant uh, for the purpose of the case. Um, and if we stop at the arbitration agreement and um, uh, consequently what arbitration rules are enshrined in, 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 uh, by the parties uh, through the arbitration agreement, and we take a look at the, at the 
few examples of arbitration rules, including the PCA, and I'm sure everybody's very familiar with the with the rules by now. Uh, we see that they 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 tend to uh, be quite general or generous uh, in the way they approach uh, the conduct of the arbitration. Um, Article 17 of the PCA rules, uh, of course, they, they, they state that the arbitral tribunal may conduct the arbitration subject to these rules in such manner as it considers appropriate, provided that the parties are treated with equality and that at an appropriate stage of the proceedings, each party is given a reasonable opportunity of presenting its case. Um, and, and of course, this is something that we see, for example, in the SEC rules or in the ICC rules. Uh, we have the delicate balance between due process. Um, Sophia was mentioning earlier uh, that, that the tribunal also has the obligation uh, to um, ensure that the arbitration is, is uh, uh, done in an in a expedited and efficient manner. And of course, the equality of the parties um, in, in the arbitration. Um, there are other provisions in the rules, um, not where the conduct of the proceedings uh, is, is discussed, but uh, uh, sometimes in the part dealing with the arbitral award, uh, for example, uh, the SEC rules uh, in Article 47, 44 provide that the arbitral tribunal may decide a separate issue or part of the dispute in a separate award. Um, the ICC arbitration rules, uh, they have, uh, as you may know, an annex in the, in the newest rules, Annex 4, on the case management techniques, uh, which is referenced in the, in the body of the ICC rules. And in this annex, uh, it is provided that uh, one of the techniques is bifurcating the proceedings or rendering one or more partial award on key issues. Um, so in general, the power, I would say, of the, of, of the arbitral tribunal is quite broad in the management of the proceedings, provided that certain requirements are, are kept in mind, as, as I was saying earlier. So I would approach, um, what, what the tribunal can do um, in the arbitration in balance with what the tribunal must do. Uh, and if we look at the uh, bifurcation and the stay of proceedings, uh, in my opinion, these are elements which fall into the, into the category of what tribunal can do. Um, and even going further, uh, when it comes to uh, parallel proceedings, in particular, when it comes to uh, the, the ones uh, envisioned by, by the Wittsmuth uh, problem this year, I would say that, that in general, there is no obligation for a tribunal to uh, uh, stay the proceedings or to bifurcate the proceedings. This, this, this falls into the, the fine distinction between can and must. Uh, and everything is obviously based on the on the on the on the facts of the case. Um, now, in in this mix of uh, of of uh, elements which must be considered obviously by the arbitral tribunal, uh, they are also uh, depending on the facts of the case uh, elements which might prove to be essential in in uh, making any decision. When we talk about the uh, uh, bribery and corruption, of course, our immediate reaction would be, what are the duties of the arbitrator when it comes to the specific issues? The duty to uh, raise it to us pointed, the duty to um, um, report it to the um, relevant authorities, um, the duties, the ethical duties the, uh, the, the arbitrators have. So there are many elements involved in this decision of the uh, of the of the uh, arbitral tribunal to go one way or the other but i would say that um in terms of when we're in the situation of already parallel proceedings uh probably another question of of relevance is to to what extent issues of uh, lease pendants would be um uh, relevant in making this decision and i will not go into details i'm sure that uh, that uh, the the participants in the vismuth have already uh discovered some of the cases uh, relevant uh, for the problem uh, but it's something to keep in mind um in the decision of the tribunal whether 
this parallel proceedings will affect in any way, in particular, uh, list pendants uh, speaking, the, um, the decision of the tribunal. In general, when, when a tribunal decides to uh, stay the proceedings in particular, um, and, and from my practical experience as arbitrator, there are certain questions an arbitrator has to ask. And probably the critical one when it comes to this parallel proceedings is how long the parallel proceed, how long the litigation will take, in this case, the cr criminal investigation, how long it will take. Uh, what are the uh, remedies against the decision, let's say, in the first instance of the court? Uh, is there an appeal? Is there a recourse? How long is it going to take? Uh, what issues are decided in that uh, litigation? Um, will that decision be material for the decision of the arbitrators um, in, 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 in staying the proceedings? Uh, what was at some points the, the timing of, of filing for a, a, a parallel litigation is relevant in the decision of the tribunal? Was it uh, litigation started before or has started during the arbitration? So it is an exercise that necessarily rests on the peculiarity of each case. But just to, to, to sum up, um, so we can we can uh, um, so I can proceed to the to my uh, case on on corruption. The general questions are for an arbitrator: what an arbitrator can do or must do, and everything else rests on the legal framework applicable in the case, and of course the facts of the case. Um, now, when it comes to uh, bribery and corruption, a very interesting. Uh, um, arbitration um, which ended up uh, for set aside and uh, refusal of recognition and enforcement of enforcement in the US courts uh, was the arbitration between Petrobras and Vantage Petroleum. And uh, it, it is a very interesting case because the U.S. courts, um, uh, the Southern District uh, of Texas uh, U.S. District Court, uh, a lot of effort in looking at this particular case, I would say. Um, now, the facts of the case are rather straightforward. Uh, Vantage uh, was a company, uh, a, a, a drilling company, uh, which entered into a contract with Petrobras. Um, there are certain entities involved there, including the uh, Petrobras Brazil. And this agreement was providing for uh, uh, drilling services. Uh, it was an eight year term contract, uh, which commenced on uh, 2nd of December, 2012, upon the delivery of ultra deep water drilling rig, um, the Titanium Explorer. So the contract started the eight year term in 2012. In 2014, Vantage and Petrobras executed the first, the third novation and amendment agreement. Um, and this amendment among others, including providing for drilling services in the Gulf of Mexico also included uh, an arbitration clause provided for ICDR AAA uh, Houston, Texas seat of arbitration. In 2015, Petrobras attempted to terminate the agreement, um, which led um, to Vantage commencing arbitration before uh, the ICDR AAA tribunal. And I have to say a stellar tribunal. Uh, the, the, the chair, Professor Rusty Park, um, Judge Brower, and uh, James Gaitis uh, as co-arbitrators. Uh, Petrobras argued that the cancellation of the agreement was due to operational failures by Vantage and that the agreement was void and unenforceable for allegedly being procured for bribery. Uh, the, fi the final award was rendered in 2018 and the majority found Petrobras liable for over 615 million US dollars for reasons of early termination of the agreement. There was a dissenting opinion, but the dissenting opinion was on procedural issues, uh, issues of due process in the arbitration, and that in itself is also very interesting. But for the purpose of our discussion, 
um, was the request um, uh, from uh, Petrobras to set aside the award. And one of the grounds uh, which was presented to the court was that the award was procured by corruption fraud, um, given the fact that the agreement was procured by bribery. Now, generally speaking, uh, one issue was uh, how far can the court go um, in, the, in, uh, in looking in, into the arbitration? And um, the court noted that defenses um, in, the, in the proceeding should be construed narrowly. Um, and if there are no extraordinary circumstances, then the court will give deference to the arbitral tribunal. Now, in the, what, it, what is important in the arbitration is how the arbitral tribunal decided um, on the allegation of the agreement being procured by bribery. And in the final award, the tribunal determined that after Petrobras was aware of the bribery allegations, it ratified the agreement. Uh, the, uh, the second amendment and the first novation to the agreement were formed without the involvement of any actors which were in, involved in the original, in the signing of the original agreement. And moreover, the contract was performed afterwards. So the arbitral tribunal basically found that the agreement was ratified. So even if, the, if there was bribery at the beginning, the agreement was, um, was ratified by subsequent conduct uh, of, of the party. Um, furthermore, um, the tribunal also found that Petrobras did not carry their burden of demonstrating that Vantage was guilty of bribery on the evidence presented to it. And even if the contract has been procured by bribery, as it was saying, it was ratified uh, subsequently. Now, the court uh, sided with the, with the arbitral tribunal, also from the point of view of the level of review that the court uh, would uh, take in the situations uh, and upheld um, the award um, uh, on, on, on this basis. Now, this is a very interesting, um, I would say, case. Um, I, I was mentioning earlier, it has, um, it, it's a case that, that has everything, bribery, corruption, uh, dissenting opinions. Uh, it has allegation of breach of due process and so on. So in itself, it's a very interesting case. But um, the, the, the interpretation the tribunal gave and the fact that the court understood um, that the tribunal decided in, in, a, in a, a proper manner, in particular because the public policy defense uh, violation could not be found by the court with respect to this issue uh, dealt with by the arbitral tribunal. Uh, probably it's important to know that one of, the, one of the arbitrators in this case, Judge Brower, has dealt extensively, and in particular in dissenting opinions, uh, while uh, he was a judge at the Iran-US Claims Tribunal. Um, and um, his approach in general in these cases, as they tra it transpires from the dissenting opinions, is that um, tribunals should be more proactive in uh, dealing with issues and bribery and corruption. Uh, I will stop here, and of course, I, I guess we have many points of discussion. Thank you. I just wanted, perhaps before we carry on, to contrast the approach in that case with uh, the very unusual and I think unique approach taken by the French courts, and particularly the Cour de Cassation, who, unlike the American courts, uh, or, the, or the English courts for that matter, uh, reopens the case on the merits uh, reopens the uh, question of the burden of proof and, and what evidence there was and what evidence has transpired since the award was rendered on the basis that um, their, their ground for doing so is to say that they cannot allow or they cannot take the risk of an award um, that may be void uh, for corruption reasons cannot enter the, uh, the French legal system, uh, because it would be against public order uh, to do that. So quite an interesting 
uh, and different um, approach to um, to the, the the position in the in the case uh, of Vantage. And we can add, of course, this is uh, this is very interesting, and 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 I'm sure that everybody went for the in detail. Those who are listening to us today for the Alstom saga. Uh, we can also contrast with the approach of the English courts, um, where the tribunal has considered and rejected uh, corruption allegation. The English courts would not generally reopen the findings um, unless there is exceptional. There are exceptional circumstances which rarely happen. Uh, I so don't think I've seen... ever seen it. <laughs> exactly, I don't think I've never seen it. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, I, I'm assuming that's uh, my cue to 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 resume uh, discussing with you and just to uh, flag some points that I think you, um, Sophie and Karina, raised in in, in for the Viz Moody's and and also for the arbitrators are are interesting to think about. So just uh, thinking about your points here, I think this the point of um, this in the case respondent being a government entity but that is acting in in a commercial capacity may have um, some influence on 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 how the, the the Moody's will pick their their arguments in 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 this case and and when it comes to the the bifurcation point I, I guess what I could uh, the, the the takeaway for me from what, what, what Karina said is that the tribunals may be thinking mostly about both the correctness of their award, but also the efficiency. So when thinking of how to be your case here for both sides, what one should be looking at with those lessons is, is there really an overlap here when it, we, we're comparing these two proceedings? Is there really a risk of, of correctness or no correctness? And then to the point of efficiency, and, and I think that's especially relevant in, in this point, um, Okay, we say we 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 stayed this proceedings until the end of of investigations, and then like Prina said, is this subject to appeal? What is the next part of the procedure? Will that also affect or impact whatever is being discussed in the arbitration? So thinking about this case, we have a what an estimate of when investigations will end, but what happens then? We know of charges that were brought in very similar cases involving the, the same public um, agent. And, 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 and those were crude no charges. What happens then? It, it, it's, um, it, it's a good point to try to think about when, when trying to build your case um, for both sides. I think that you, you can be creative in, in, in saying that whatever happens later won't matter or, or, or saying that no, this is subject to, to, to appeal forever. I think there are facts on the case that you can grasp from and, and, and discuss this point. And Luisa, I'm sorry, just before we leave that point on efficiency, can I just say, and I'm sorry to uh, bring the news to you, but I think that's a complete red herring. And I, I say this with the utmost respect to the ICC and its Annex 4, but bifurcation as a tool of efficiency I think is happens in a very small minority of cases where you have a clear point of law or admissibility that is completely divorced from everything else. And in all other cases that I've seen, it is, uh, it is first of all, a, a real hostage to fortune to tribunals because you are deciding early on uh, something that may well fi you find out later on in the case is connected to other things that have not been decided. And then you're stuck with something that is decided and which comes back to haunt you. So that's first. And second of all, it is a number of different separate proceedings. And unless you're deciding a an issue that really allows the parties to whittle down what's going on or progress in whatever other strategy they might have, which might be uh, to uh, mediate or to cut down the number of issues between them or to agree quantum. I mean, it is, it is, you have to have a number of, um, of uh, considerations that all coalesce together for bifurcation to really have the efficiency, uh, the efficiency target that, uh, and I'm, I have to say this whole um, um, idea that bifurcation and several partial awards might, might bring efficiency is I think as a proposition wrong uh, in the sense of not true, 
<laughs> and, uh, and and that it, it is true only in a, in a very small minority. And again, I mean, this is a very practical point. On paper, it looks great. I agree, it looks great on paper. But uh, but in, in, in the real uh, life, in the trenches, I can tell you, not so often looks great. I, I, I fully agree with Sophie, and I'll, I'll give you some numbers so everybody's convinced by that <laughs> because we're on the same page. Looking at the, at the investment arbitration cases where uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with some of the cases involving bribery and corruption, but in investment cases, when we look at the bifurcation, um, a, a, a case not, not bifurcated would take an average of 1,336 days, which is uh, a, a bit more than three years and a half. Uh, a case that is bifurcated and proceeds to the merit stage afterwards takes 1,893 days. So this is 500 days added to the proceedings when these are bifurcated. So Sophie was uh, not only right, but absolutely right. Uh, it may be efficient, there are strategies. Um, um, the, the tribunal has to be careful because as I was saying earlier, the tribunal can, but must not uh, in this way. Of course, it's a, it, the, the question when both parties want uh, uh, to bifurcate, then, then we, it's a separate discussion. And, and the other point I wanted to add is, um, as we're looking at, the, at the bribery and corruption, uh, and probably I would say a, the small number of cases, if, if you research the, uh, what case was maybe closer to, to the Vismut or relevant for your position, uh, there was a study, um, I think about 10 years ago, um, uh, done by uh, by Cecily Rose, and and she found that uh, arbitral tribunals try to evade having to deal with the issues of corruption, uh, which we would call it the, the arbitral tribunal would pick um, a different fight, and therefore will not have to decide the issues of bribery and corruption, and and I think that is uh, concerning and. Quite well reflected in, in particular in, in, in the approach in the investment arbitration cases, where a few tribunals were bold enough to use the adverse inferences and therefore um, uh, deal with the with the, the issues of bribery and corruption. Uh, thank you, Karina, uh, and thank you, Sophie. Um, I will leave uh, the, the discussion or, or, or the disputed uh, or non-disputed at this point, uh, point of efficiency. And, and, and I think, well, it, uh, your, your clarifications were great. And, 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 and I am convinced that this might not be the most efficient solution, in, especially given the numbers that, uh, that, that Karina shared with us. Um, and, and I think that's um, definitely a point that the Moody should be should be ready to address, uh, and and of course on, on on both points there are things that there are issues that are going to be stronger on, on one side, and 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 on other. But if we can stay, and I think we have already started here a more uh, in, informal conversation, and, and just because we we stay within this uh, broad topic of corruption, and in, in, in the Vismu case this year, there well the the first issue is 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 jurisdiction, right? So we we're, we're having a a validity issue um, with the arbitration agreement, and and just um, a few points, and, and then I will open for um, for Krina and Sophie to tell me if they think the Moody's can 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 explore this fast. But when it comes to an arbitration agreement being invalid, well, the argument here, respondent says, is that the main agreement is already tainted by corruption, and then by consequence, the the arbitration um, agreement would be, and. Um, well, here in, in, in this group. It, so there's it, a one word answer to that, right? It's called separability. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was, uh, that's that a was, very, that's an open and shut case. Uh, if, if, if the, and, and of course the, I don't know what, um, what uh, the, the specific law in Equatoriana has to say, but, uh, but certainly in any, any system that I know of, any modern system of law, the arbitrators have the power to rule on their own jurisdiction and regardless of the validity or invalidity of the rest of the agreement. So I don't think, unfortunately, that's not, uh, not a very 
interesting point. <laughs> yeah. Sorry uh, about that. No, I, I, I also think that, uh, and, and uh, this is something that uh, one has to think about uh, at what level the corruption or um, Let's say, what is the role of corruption in 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 uh, the specific case? Because if you have a, a contract that was procured by corruption, uh, the consequence, uh, or as we call it, this is avoidable contract. Uh, but when you have a contract that provides for corruption, then uh, a, a null and void is written on it. This doesn't affect obviously the what what, what Sophie rightly said. But uh, if you look at the case law. Um, tribunals approach it uh, in a, in a in a careful manner, um, and also don't forget that different jurisdictions have different approaches. Uh, if we look at the Alstom case and and the and the outcome in Switzerland, uh, just to give an example. Yeah, uh, and th thank you for clarifying. Is that the the word that I uh, th that I was going to say? It's exactly your, your your point on severability because. I think we all here in this group understand that this is a separate con contract and, and, and an autonomous agreement. Several um, domestic laws will 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 provide for that, and and, and that's the very nature uh, of of arbitration agreements. But in 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 the, in the corruption cases, uh, my point here will mostly go to the Moody's. We all know it's it's severable, but. It, can, can you guys look for cases or uh, look at case law? Has there been cases where the invalidity of the main contract, and then you can try to look especially for, for, for corruption cases also affected the arbitration agreement? Does it have to be something that taints the arbitration agreement directly? Um, or is there any way that this could be considered um, tainted or, or affected by the the the, the the defects in, in, in the main contract. And then on the point that uh, so um, Sophie raised on, on the applicable law, what does Equatoriana law said? We, we, we know that Equatoriana law governs uh, the, the main contract, but to the point of, of the arbitration agreement, one of the points in, in, in this case is that there's a provision in, well, there are two provisions of domestic law that are, that are relevant here. So the first one concerns the authorization from the parliament. So the constitution of Equatoriana says that for state entities to, to get involved in, in, in the arbitration, they would need an, an approval. And then it, it's what well, it looks like in this case, this approval was not obtained. And, and instead this, this, this contract was uh, procured suspiciously. And then respondent also was the by respondent uh, who is the, the, the state party and then Respondent um, itself um, uh, now the the other grounds that they raise for invalidity is that if they comply with the award, which would they decided to keep and, and, and they signed, that would be a violation of domestic Equatorial law. So enforcing the the arbitration agreement in in respondent's point of view would be. Um, against the Equatoriana provision, legal provision that says you can enforce agreements tainted by corruption. So another path for you, for the Moody's to explore is, what is this agreement that the domestic law says? First, is this part of domestic law really applicable to the conclusion of uh, an enforcement of, of, of the arbitration agreement, or does it only relate uh, to the main contract? So I think severability be, uh, can be used here too on the point of specific um, authorization, and especially on the point of how complying with this award could uh, eventually violate provisions of, of, of domestic law. So just a few points that you probably can explore on, on does the, is domestic law relevant and then what does it really apply to if it is relevant? Um, I think, it, it, I, mean, I mean, we can uh, continue discussing. So I will ask the, the speakers or even our hosts here if they have any more comments on, on, on substance of what we've been discussing because we had reserved, uh, given that we have two very <laughs> experienced arbitrators here, some time to discuss more general tips and hints for the arbitrators, I, especially for first time. I think just a, just a remark, I see that there are some questions or requests in the chat, in the Q&A. Uh, and I think one relates to the cases we've mentioned. Uh, I don't think we have a chat uh, function here, so I'm happy to repeat 
uh, the 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 cases I mentioned is um, vantage. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's not advantage. It's vantage versus Petrobras. You can find the case uh, in a Kluver arbitration database. Um, the Alstom case, uh, as well as wildly discussed, ABL versus Al Alstom, um, impossible to miss it if uh, you, you're researching any issues of bribery and corruption. Not sure if I mentioned another one, but. Uh... Uh, I, I'm also looking at the, the chat now to see if there's. Uh, uh... Uh, uh, Luisa. If I may ask our speakers a question, uh, I thank you. Uh, I, I, uh, Sophie raised the the approach by the French courts, and then Krina commented on the Alstom saga, right? And I, actually, my question was related to that the one I had uh, written down here beforehand. Uh, it seems that this, as Sophie said, this uh, French approach is unique, is not the uh, standard approach. Uh, but uh, uh, thinking in terms of uh, uh, trying to view this from different angles, uh, do you think that uh, that approach, the, the one that, it, it, first of all, please confirm if my, my, my understanding of it is correct, it seems to lead to some type of de novo review, uh, like a full-fledged review of the facts and the evidence uh, in the, the courts, the state courts are not limited to merely uh, checking whether the uh, uh, arbitrators, for instance, uh, discussed and uh, entertained the allegations of corruption, but actually uh, take a, make a new decision about, uh, about, about that topic, right? And, uh, so, uh, if uh, if there is that risk that courts may take that approach, and uh, and uh, um, in a way uh, frustrate the work of the tribunal in dealing with this with this topic, uh, would that be a reason uh, in favor of staying the proceedings uh, until? Uh, a final determination is made by the by the state entities or the state uh, or bodies that are in charge of prosecuting corruption in the uh, relevant state here in the in the case. So uh, would it, would it make sense uh, in terms of uh, policy maybe uh, to stay the proceedings and see what courts are going to do with the corruption allegations before uh, moving on and maybe. Uh, spending more resources in the arbitration, if it, in theory, it can be frustrated? Thank you. It's a great question. Um, and, and I'm going to answer simply from my position as an observer. I mean, I absolutely have no inside knowledge of, of, uh, of the Cour de Cassation's uh, thinking about this other than what, what they say in their, uh, in their decision. I don't see it as a um, demolition or underpinning of what arbitration tribunals are trying to do. If anything, I think the French Court of Cassation has shown itself to be one of the most uh, arbitration friendly, uh, militant, pro-arbitration uh, bodies uh, in, in the Western world. Um, I think they are trying to do two things. They're trying to protect the public order uh, of the French legal system. And they are trying to allow the tribunals to do their work to the extent that they can. And then at the enforcement stage, if, because don't forget that often something happens where the state says nothing during the proceedings and then raises the corruption card at the enforcement stage, which the tribunals will have had little knowledge of or little evidence about. And so this, the court then can step in with all of its powers and reopen and 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 look at the, the um at, at the novo as you say at at the alteration so it really is i would say um i mean it is it, it can be i suppose from the tribunal's perspective uh dispiriting uh but at the same time it is really a safety net that's what it is and that's how i see it frankly uh the um, the other thing that's important to, to, to find out as well is that this is an approach that may not work in all jurisdictions. Don't forget that the Code de Cassation does not involve six-week trials, 
does not involve, uh, it's an inquisitorial system. It is a very, very short hearing of half a day at most, no matter how important. So it is a process that allows this sort of reopening de novo. If anywhere else that has an advers a full-fledged adversarial system, it would, it would become a very expensive process indeed. So I think one has to look at it in its context. Uh, and it is, it is a, um, a system that works, I think, in the French uh, context. And it does allow tribunals to say, well, why should I stay? I should just go on with what I've got before me. And if I missed something or if something else uh, comes out, then obviously there, if there is a challenge, and there usually is, then I will have this safety net to rely on. It's a, it's a different, slightly different dynamic. But I can see, I can certainly see that uh, some tribunals might say, well, uh, I don't want to take that chance uh, and, and I, should, I should probably stay. But uh, I think that would be probably the wrong way to look at it. And, and and the and if 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 I can add, if we look at the at, at the series of cases uh, before the before the French courts, um, one will understand that uh, the review of the facts um, will happen only when there is a manifest um, effective and concrete violation of the public policy. And although the French courts uh, take as a standard of proof in uh, in this type of cases the red flags, uh, th they will not always be, uh, let's say, um, uh, quick to 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 set aside or to refuse the recognition and enforcement uh, of an award. And one good example is a recent case from 2017, the um, RDC Congo versus uh, Customs and Tax Consultancy. And in that case, um, before the tribunal, it was asked, argued that the agreement was uh, uh, agreement which was supposed to uh, provide for the improvement of custom and taxes in in uh, Congo was procured uh, by corruption because it was not awarded by public tender, and uh, and uh, when it uh, came before the court, the Paris Court of Appeal. Uh, the court said that the absence of transparency, while it is a significant red flag um, of corruption, it is not sufficient um, to, to establish it. Uh, and, and an additional uh, issue which was also relevant for the, for the Court of Appeal is that the uh, Republic of Congo could not uh, invoke uh, its own um, police powers um, um, in, in support of this argument. Uh, so, so I think I think what Sophie is saying uh, is, is the safety net works very well when it when actually they're the 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 I would say in support of uh, of arbitral tribunals, but the French courts are not so liberal as as uh, as, uh, as one might think. Thank you, thank you. That was uh, excellent, very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you all on, on, on sources and, and, and thank you, Karina, for bringing my attention to, to the, the chat in, in, in the bottom here. Um, for the, there's a question here just um, for you to remind the, the source of the statistics you presented. I recall you saying there are um, specifically an investor state disputes. Um, yes, it's, it's a paper uh, which was public, published in the um, Journal of Dispute uh, Settlement. Um, uh, we also find it in the um, the the webpage of the ISDS Academic Forum. It is a paper published, I think, in two thousand nineteen or twenty twenty. I I should remember because I I was one of the authors. And we look at the duration of uh, investment uh, arbitration proceedings in the context of uh, of the ISDS reform. Uh, so I think the, the best way is to go to the ISDS Academic Forum because it's uh, open source and, uh, and uh, there are several papers uh, there. One of them is duration. Perfect. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that gives them enough <laughs> information to, 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 to find the, the, the correct source. Um, and, and, and one other point here, and maybe we, we don't have time to get too much into it, but from... Um, the questions, I'm trying to avoid the questions that are <laughs> literally questions on how to defend one party <laughs> or, or the other. 
Um, but, but there is a clarification in the case. That I, I, I'm not sure if the, this was an anonymous question. Uh, um, I'm not sure if the question relates to that clarification, but it, it's generally what do we think about the United Nations Convention Against Corruption and what would be the impact in the present case? The, the case has um, has a clarification or, or a note on, on, on procedural order number two, I can't recall exactly now, but it says that all contracting um, states involved in, in, in the case, which is, well one, well, one of the parties from a state, but not technically a state, but they are all uh, invoked states are parties um, to this convention. So, um, if you have I, I'll, I'll try to be brief as, as, as brief as, as Sophie was earlier and say, well, these are all wonderful um, um, conventions. There is also the 1997 OECD Convention on Combating Bribery uh, of Foreign Public Officials in International Business Transaction. I have to read this. Uh, I wrote it down. With the UN Convention as well of 2003, with over 160 uh, states, these are excellent initiatives that uh, um, likely to, to trigger a response of the states for their national legislation. And, and uh, um, as, as you may know, the US Foreign Corrupt Policy Practices Act is one of the leading legislation on this matter. But uh, the answer is, these are wonderful initiatives that lack enforcement mechanism. So I think, I think they are uh, uh, an incentive for states to do something, but themselves are, are less relevant because of the absence of this enforcement mechanism. Uh, Luisa, if I may, uh, about that point, Karina, uh, wouldn't that be an incentive for, for us as arbitrators to uh, pay attention to that to that convention in terms of private enforcement of the convention's guidelines. Uh, so uh, it is mentioned uh, in cases. It is mentioned in in the investment arbitration cases quite often. So the um, if if my memory is uh, helps me here in the uh, metal tech versus Uzbekistan, and I think the Belkan case. Uh, the, the 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 tribunal looked at the um, um, at the convention, so there is a let, let's put it this way: there is an aid for uh, the arbitrators to feel comfortable if they they go on the route of red flags and adverse inferences. I would say. Yeah, I I, I will note on 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 this case. Uh... Appointments in the tender documents. I think in in this case there was a, a, a reference to the to to the UN conventions, which well, I, I think the parties could try eventually to to argue that that is incorporated in a contract. But uh, from my reading of it, um, I, I mean, we're not here to give you specifically uh, specific advice on 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 how to build your case. But I would just know that that this document um, only applies to the validity of the 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 tender uh, process and excluding and including um, bidders from, from the tender process. So if you were thinking about arguments under, um, around the UN convention be because of this document um, in the case, um, I think you should, um, should just pay attention to, 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 to other documents that and, and And with that, I think we, well, we had, of Lisa, course, as a, please keep. Let, no, let's no, I, I, there is a there are a couple of questions here in the Q and A that I I, I think we uh, we can still uh, go on a few more minutes here and see if we can address them. I uh, one uh, well, Sophie mentioned the need to be practical. One is very practical here, and I would like to hear both both of you what you think. Uh, Rawa Kazim asked, uh, "What happens if the tribunal rules no corruption?" Uh, what would happen to the tribunal? Uh, so it, uh, um, the uh, 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 if if uh, as, as if, if if this case goes to a French court, for instance, uh, for enforcement, and the French court decides that it has to review everything again, finds that there was in fact corruption, but the tribunal had ruled no corruption, and the question is, uh, what happens if anything to the tribunal? Would the tribunal be in trouble in that situation? That's Nothing happens the to question. tribunal. The tribunal is found to sophisticate. Sorry, I have a very noisy uh, 
ambulance. Um, the tribunal is functus officio once it has uh, rendered its decision, rightly or wrongly, no matter the correctness of the decision, and on 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 uh, on corruption as as with other. Um, as with other uh, matters, the tribunal can get it wrong, uh, and and uh, you know it's not going to be uh, burnt at the stake for that reason. It's a, however, you know when a court comes to look at this and 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 decides that um, the tribunal for some reason uh, did not make the finding that it should have made, uh, it's egg on the arbitrator's faces, but uh, but nothing nothing happens to the to the tribunal. I mean, one has to be a little bit careful about this. Um, uh, don't forget that a tribunal, an arbitral tribunal, because of its uh, the way that it is, that it operates, that it it is it is in the it is a creature of the consent of the parties. It has very limited investigative powers. It cannot attract before it third parties, people who don't want to come voluntarily to see it. It cannot issue subpoenas of its own volition, and we're not even sure that it can actually properly raise to a sponte these questions or report them to authorities. I mean, we are completely shackled. And so one, I, I don't think that the tribunal should feel particularly awful for not spotting uh, a corruption allegation that turns out to be proven because down the line, a court with its arsenal of, of very powerful means um, is able to find uh, that this actually happened. So, I mean, this, obviously, I am putting aside those cases where tribunals sort of go like this and don't want to see what is there to be seen. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a tribunal that, within its limited means, is trying to probe certain things and comes and, and often has zero um, participation or, or co collaboration from the parties, and at one point just throws its hands up and says, I'm not seeing enough. And then it turns out to be wrong. I, I don't think there's anything particularly uh, egregious about that. It is a limitation of the arbitration process. And, and it is a real limitation of the arbitration process. And, and I think the parties that are invoking corruption in arbitration know exactly what they're doing because they know that from that point, that point on, the arbitration, the, arbitration, the arbitration tribunal is in trouble. It's in trouble because there's only very, very few things that it can do, which is why, to come back to the ICC working group, that's where we're hoping to allow, to give some tools to tribunals, um, to get them to at least have the confidence of saying um, there is some sort of a consensus within this field that this is the, this is the inquiry that I should be pursuing. But it only can go so far. Mm -hmm. Sophie, I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, one more question here. I think this goes to what you were saying in, in the beginning of, of our discussion. There is a question in, in the chat here, which is, can a tribunal evaluate evidence from a court proceeding regarding corruption? I think in, in, in the beginning uh, of your talk, um, you mentioned something about the tribunal um, having conversations potentially with, with the authorities and some sort of um, collaboration. So, um, how would I, I think we already <laughs> know, but how would you answer this question about um, using evidence um, in, from from um, the the corruption um, proceedings in public? I mean, often cities? often tribunals find that they cannot have access to that evidence at all, uh, they, uh, with very good reasons. I mean, the the authorities of the state concerned are not going to start talking about the investigation because they don't want to tip off whomever uh, they, they, they think uh, they might want to charge. So that's why it's such a difficult uh, field. And, and one of the questions that we're looking at in the working group is, are there any um, jurisdictions where the authorities might be open to having that discussion with the tribunal privately? And that throws up all sorts of difficulties from the tribunal's perspective as to the confidentiality of the arbitration proceedings or the privacy of the arbitration proceedings and the, uh, the the very important public order elements of the uh, official state investigation. I mean, but the fact is that carrying on like two silo proceedings is not helpful. It's not helpful and it, it really affects the legitimacy of the arbitral process if at the end of the day, 
the, the, the arbitrators go carry on and decide what they decide, and then the investigators find the opposite at the other end. Uh, it, it just is not helpful uh, not to have that convergence. Thank you. Uh, thank you for um, your answer. I think that we can enter one more question from the chat, but before we do that, um, I, I'll ask our hosts. I see there's one hand up in from the attendees list, and I'm not sure um, whether, or there's a couple hands up now, uh, but I'm not sure if-, if um, No, if I, I don't think they, I don't think, I don't think they are able to speak actually, but if they can <laughs> ask questions through the Q and A or make comments actually, if they want. Yeah. Uh, so of course, otherwise we'll just wait back to do uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it, thank you for this. And and then I think for out of the um, more straight to the point questions here, and, and, and this is a good one because it asks um, for your opinion. I, I like the, the intro. In your opinions, does lack of consent affect the doctrine of, of separability? I, I think I already know what uh, our, our speakers um, are, are going to say, but I wanted to ask if anybody has um, any any specific thoughts here, um, I, and I can share mine too afterwards. Please share yours because I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so maybe I should. From whom? Maybe I should put it uh, in context. I, I guess we try to stay away from the specific issues of the, uh, the 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 problem, but I think I know where this question is coming from. So it's uh, th there's a fact in, in the case. But so basically, one of the grounds that the respondent raised for the invalidity of the arbitration agreement is lack of consent because there was a specific authorization missing. So under domestic equatorial law, the parliament should authorize. I think this question is coming from the fact that the specific authority, the empowered person that would be able to bind um, that, that entity to an arbitration agreement uh, did, did not consent. So I think that's where the, the question is coming from. But then the question is, does that affect the doctrine of, of separability? Um, I, I don't think this this specific um, effect of the lack of consent in, 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 in a specific case could affect the doctrine of, of separability um, it, itself. Um, the, the arbitration agreement will, will still be um, severable, but the lack of consent, what you can use is to determine. I mean, what... I can I can think of uh, I I can think uh, like a, a, a just making a parallel, and and I, and I agree. Um, we had uh, before the Swedish courts uh, on numerous occasions the situation where uh, w one of the parties, um, as a requirement under the domestic legislation, was supposed to stamp the contracts in addition to signing, uh, and the stamp was missing from the contract and therefore the argument was uh, the, the contract doesn't exist uh, and therefore we are not even discussing about the issue of separability uh, at all because there is no contract in the sense and 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 the tribunals can go, the, they they held and 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 the swedish courts uh, in in the set aside proceedings they unanimously held uh, you have to look at the applicable law obviously uh, and uh, and um, uh, the, the answer is well, the tribunal still has to decide on this. Um, so I even if you if you raise it, the tribunal still keeps the power to look at uh, the arbitration uh, agreement um, and at the contract. Well, uh, just as a follow up question to that one, uh, I I think uh, the approach in the U.S. is. Pretty much what the what the person asking the question here was thinking of uh, the idea that uh, consent is primarily something something to be decided by the court and not by the tribunal. If the, if there is uh, if there is an issue of consent, which means an issue of formation of the arbitration agreement, uh, it wouldn't make sense for 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 the tribunal to address that. That's the that's a different approach from what we have in Brazil. It's probably a different approach from most uh, countries that follow. That's the I think of the U.S. are an outlier on this one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so it's a it's a it, it's the the French <laughs> the the parallel with the French regarding the uh, the novel review there of uh, those uh, corruption yes. uh, allegations. That's the U.S. approach to competence, competence, right? And 
So uh, would that maybe explain this idea that lack of consent could affect separability and uh, affect maybe the existence? Well, I mean, I, 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 as I said, I struggle with the with the word consent here. To me, it's more lack of validity because there was a, a allegedly a, a, a um, an approval that was missing. So it, it's a matter of the validity of the contract because the contract was entered into for, from what, what I understand uh, the facts to be. There, there was an agreement, the drones were delivered. Uh, so someone yeah. agreed to that. It's more, yeah, but, it's more but, the, the stamp that Karina's talking about that was not put on it. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but uh, probably the state would say that from its point of view, uh, the formation of the state's consent uh, would have that as a, as a, as a, as a completely, as an but the state is not a party to this case. Uh, that's what I was yeah, I was sure. talking about <laughs> earlier. Uh, we are talking about a state emanation, but uh, but that hence hence the importance of looking at who the parties are exactly. So I think that that argument can obviously uh, turn on these on these on these points. Um, well, excellent. I I think we're almost uh, at our at our time, uh, we've reached the entire time. We had reserved some time to maybe have our, our speaker share a couple of tips, like general tips in, in preparation for, for students or for arbitrators that are going to the mood maybe for the first time, or maybe not. <laughs> maybe they've been coming for 15 years. Uh, we we never know, but uh, I think we have three minutes. So Sophie and Krina, if each of you could say in very generic terms, if you have one tip for students or arbitrators, especially newcomers uh, going into the VIS, uh, what would that be in, in your experience? And we're no longer talking about uh, legal issues here, or or we are. <laughs> um, Let go of your weak points. It's always uh, infuriating for tribunals to see uh, advocates wanting to nail down every single point. They're not all good. There will be some strong ones, there will be some weaker ones. Let's focus on the strong ones and you will make much more of an impact. Uh, I will I will continue also with the with the ad, an, an advice along these lines, which is uh, make sure that you understand the case from um, a commercial point of view uh, as, as, as a holistic way of approaching the case. We students tend to uh, participants tend to stick into these details without uh, trying to see the the whole picture. For example, what happens with the award? Um, what are the consequences, and so on and so forth? So just just zoom out and and, and try to understand the case um, as a whole. And and the other point is um, uh, there are many resources available, uh, uh, and you can rely on them. Uh, Kluver Arbitration Blog uh, is uh, has a wealth of resources which suit your case. <laughs> um, we used to do in the past like a compilation um, for, for the of the posts uh, relevant for the for the case. But we're going to do this again. But in the meantime, you can use the search button. Uh, you'll see that uh, you'll find some interesting uh, interesting uh, uh, publications. So that that would be important. Absolutely fantastic that it is kept free access as well, which uh, for which it uh, should be commended. Thank you, Sophie. <laughs> um, Cesar, Cristina, do you guys have any general tips? Otherwise, uh, I, I, I'll try to give one to two to arbitrators, which I, I would say is a personal <laughs> view. But um, please go ahead. My, first. my my only tip is to watch the recording of the session here over and over again before the competition in, <laughs> in April. My tip is as well is the same and also to watch again the the webinar we we did last year says about how to arbitrate at the Vismut. We will release the link again. So the video again so everyone can watch it but this is mostly uh, targeting arbitrators but anyway uh, so just this uh, thank you Chris I, I, I will uh, before I turn it back to you guys to end uh, this webinar I'd say my my only uh, 
tip and also probably hope that I would have had um, as a former Moody, as Christina said, she called me a Moody, but I think <laughs> we're a few years uh, past that. But thank you, uh, Christina, uh, specifically for arbitrators, especially those um, young and, and coming to, to arbitrate. Um, for the first time, obviously, we get very enthusiastic about the case, of, about the problem, and especially when you're there sitting in a tribunal and the parties are pleading. Um, one thing that you should remember is that this is a moot case and, and, and it is a competition, so you shouldn't really be relying when evaluating on what the real outcome would be in real life. So what is the, the winning side? What the, how would this case turn out in real life? but rather look at whereas the parties and, and the students have picked the best or maybe not winning, but the best arguments for their case and then have succeeded in, in, in presenting their case. So basically do not let um, the, the, the case is designed for this to be balanced uh, between the parties, but there will be um, things that don't make sense for one side and, and for the other side and that students are still in, 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 in that position. So that, that would be my, my, only, my only reminder is that when you're judging, this is a this is a moot case. Um, but but that's all on my side. And, and I really wanted to thank uh, Cesar and, and Christina for inviting me to to moderate this discussion, and, and Krina and Sophie for for teaching me so much in under an hour and a half. Uh, I also definitely feel more prepared to to arbitrate pre moots in in if if I need to or actually I would like to. So thank you. Well, I think we're going to close now, but before I would like to, again, uh, thank Sophie and Karina for sharing their, their thoughts and, and, and some of their, their time here with us uh, today. Uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful that we, we had more than 100 participants all the time, and we still have now 99. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, I, I'd like to uh, tell our, our uh, attendees here that uh, there are some questions that we were not able to answer. Uh, we, we will be able to keep them and send them, send them to the speakers uh, and ask, ask them to uh, kindly uh, answer if, if, it, if that's possible. If for any reason uh, you don't get an answer, that's because we may not be able to reach you. I don't know. I'm not sure. For instance, the anonymous attendees, we will certainly not be able to reach. And so if you want to not be anonymous anymore and send us an email uh, with your questions, we'll be, we'll be happy to forward them to the speakers. And, and before we close, I, I would like to again invite you to the second session of the, the series, uh, which will take place on the 2nd of February. And we will discuss uh, with uh, Ingeborg Schwenzer, Edgardo Munoz, and Paula Costa Silva, the substantive issues of this year's mood problem. So thank you again and see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye bye.